good afternoon and good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's fantastic to have you with us today. Um, and we, it's really my honor and privilege to moderate this webinar. Um, this is the 13th webinar in our local and subnational government information series. Um, and I'd like to just take this moment to give a very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Uh, this webinar series is made possible with support from the Post 2020 Biodiversity Framework EU Support Program, um, and we are really grateful to be to be working um, with them. Uh, this webinar is also brought to you on behalf of the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments, um, for which ICLE is the focal point to the CBD. Um, and I just want to take a brief moment to situate this webinar within the series for the year. Um, you can see I've highlighted where we are and, and you can see uh, the upcoming webinars that we hold monthly, uh, the next one being on the 23rd of July. Um, and we encourage you to, to visit our dedicated platform and to please register for all of the webinars uh, to keep up to date with the very exciting unfolding process. Um, so today's topic, um, let me first introduce myself. I'm Timothy Blatch and I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa in the ICLE Cities Biodiversity Centre, uh, which is embedded in the ICLE Africa Regional Office. Um, and today I'm really thrilled uh, to be moderating the webinar and the title uh, is reflecting on the journey since 2010. We're actually going to go a little bit before 2010 in actual fact. Um, and really start to look at an overview of some of the achievements, um, the plan of action, um, and also uh, start to look to the future based on, on everything that, that we have learned. Uh, so very briefly, this is, uh, you'll recognize this slide from our previous webinars, just to situate us on the roadmap to COP15. We're currently in the Edinburgh process, and I have a, an announcement on that in the next slide. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to the SABSTA 24 and SBI 3 meetings in the bottom in the green box, uh, just to uh, let you know that we have had formal uh, notification that these meetings that were originally scheduled to take place in August uh, are likely to be uh, postponed or are definitely postponed. Uh, the exact dates and modes of delivery of these uh, meetings will be communicated in due course and we will continue to keep you up to date on this. Um, but for now, it's looking like it will be in about October. So a quick announcement on the Edinburgh process. As you know, the online consultation has been open um, since the 29th of April. Um, and it was originally set to close on the 29th of May. However, in order to ensure that we're capt capturing uh, the as many contributions and inputs as possible, uh, the decision has been made by the Scottish Government and partners uh, to extend the online consultation um, up until the 12th of June. This means you will have some time for those who uh, have not had a chance to make their inputs. There are a few key consultation documents uh, on, into which you can make your inputs via uh, some Google Forms. Uh, and for those who have not registered for the process, the email address on your screen uh, will provide you access to the Attendify app, uh, which uh, houses the variety of resources and the links to all the webinars and the consultation documents themselves. Um, so we really encourage everyone to get involved and, and join us in this very important process. Uh, as we consult the constituency on the post-2020 framework, on the recommendations for uh, a dedicated decision, um, and on the Edinburgh Declaration. So it's my absolute pleasure today to introduce you to our four uh, panelists. I'm calling them panelists, but we're really here to have an informal and open discussion. Um, all four of these panelists have been around and, and active in the space for many, many years, um, and we really want to pick their brains a little bit today and, and take the opportunity to really reflect on, on all that has taken place right from the early days and where the start of this advocacy agenda was born um, up until the moment we find ourselves in now, uh, you know, through the decades, how far we've come. Uh, and each one of these panelists brings a, a very unique perspective and uh, a wealth of knowledge and experience. So we're really looking forward to have a chat. Uh, all together. Um, our first panelist is Kobe Brandt, who you will all know, uh, the Regional Director of ICLE Africa and the Global Director of the ICLE Cities Biodiversity Centre. 
Um, the second panelist is Suzanne Nolden, and Suzanne is based in Bonn in Germany and, and works in the Department of International Affairs and Global Sustainability in, in the city. Um, our next panelist is Oliver Hillel, who is also no stranger to these webinars. Um, Oliver is a program officer at the SCBD, and, and we, it's fantastic to have his inputs. Um, and finally, least, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Mr. Grant Pearsall. Um, and Grant has recently retired from the city of Edmonton, uh, but has a, had a long career as a, a director in the city's planning and leadership team. Uh, so a very warm welcome to our four panelists. It's wonderful to have you with us, and we really look forward to a very rich discussion. Just to run through the agenda quickly, I'm going to hand over in a second to uh, Kobe, who will give us a, a very exciting announcement about a, a, a brand new document that has been produced, and that will set the stage for this open discussion as we share stories and, and reflect on the journey uh, that has brought us to this point. Thereafter, time permitting, we hope to open the floor for some questions and discussion. Uh, and there's a few ways you can do this. Please feel free to make use of the chat box throughout the webinar. Um, alternatively, at the end, when we open the floor, you can raise your hand in the panel on the right, and we will um, unmute you to ask your question. I should probably mention that this webinar will be recorded, and the recording as well as the presentation will be made available to all those who have registered in a follow-up email. And in that email, we will also include some key links uh, to the various resources that are mentioned uh, throughout the webinar, including the one that Kobe is about to speak to. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kobe to tell us about the launch of this very exciting document. Thanks for being with us, and over to you, Kobe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy. And you can move us to the next slide. Um, I would like to um, just, um, it's a real honor, really, to share with you uh, some very exciting news today. Um, Heart of the Press is our document uh, called Overview of Achievements Following the Adoption of the historic decision 1022, also known uh, by our community as the plan of action on subnational government cities and other local authorities for biodiversity. Um, this decision 1022 was historic in many ways. Um, it certainly um, ushered in a new era for the UN to specifically have a dedicated focused decision on subnational and local governments. And um, it was first done in the CB, CBD uh, context, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And subsequently, we've seen that there's also been dedicated decisions on cities, for instance, SDG 11, et cetera. And there's a lot of movement also um, in recognition and support of the actions and roles that cities could and should be playing in the climate space, in desertification, and in fact, in, in all development agendas, because we know that many of the, decision, the decisions that are made um, by the parties of the different conventions at the global level by the nation states are actually carried through and implemented on the ground at local level. And what we have here, this document really gives us an overview of what's been achieved through that dedicated decision 1022, which was adopted in Nagoya in Japan at COP10. And um, it, it gave us the framework and the bedrock under which many local and subnational governments and national governments and partners, organizations like ICLI and others, have been able to mobilize action and implementation uh, by and for cities and regions on the ground. So this document captures a bit of that history, which we were all part of, proudly part of, and uh, it has diverse examples from around the world. We can move along um, to the next slide. It um, uh, the, the document is actually structured uh, in different sections. Um, so I said it, it's got a short history that led to the actual decision of, uh, of uh, decision 1022, um, the plan of action um, of COP10, but it also then the heart of it is um, a summary of the achievements that are linked to the decision that, that sprung up from the decision and in support of the decision by a variety of role players. So this document, it's dated the May version, May 2020 version of this document is um, not 
uh, absolutely conclusive in the sense that it doesn't capture everything that's happened around the world. That's impossible. But um, we want to actually allow people to now suggest contributions that they have that, that were also uh, in support of 20, copy, uh, decision 1022. And people are invited to make uh, their contributions through a dedicated Google form until the middle of August, after which we will then finalize this document and um, really pre present it as a true reflection of the historic significance and the history really of the last 15 years um, that uh, we will present this document to the co-chairs of the um, COP15 and to the executive secretary of the CBD for information and for sharing um, in their deliberations as they work on a post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, making sure that they capture the rich stories, the successes um, and the lessons learned and that, that one can strengthen the existing efforts and initiatives that are already so successfully underway by so many parties um, um, and stakeholders all around the world. Um, so on to the next slide, um, Timothy, um, just to conclude on this um, why was this developed? I think um, I've, I've already really spoken about this, but it's really important to capture what has happened since um, Decision 1022, um, because we are at this moment in time, um, at the end of that decision, the uh, plan of action, which was uh, inherent in the Decision 1022, um, comes to an end at the end of this year. It's the plan of action 2011 to 2020. So it concludes this year and it will leave us with a vacuum if we do not uh, convince the parties and if the parties themselves do not adopt another dedicated decision which can again lead us forward into the next decade and beyond 2030 as well um, uh, in terms of uh, the role of the very pivotal role of cities and subnational governments in implementing any new global biodiversity framework after 2020. So that's very, very important that we actually write up the history because as we know, history tells us a lot of what works, what doesn't, doesn't work and what to build on. And with these so many rich lessons that we can learn from this document. Um, so the final slide I think is the next one. Um, which yeah, actually pre uh, ends my um, a uh, little bit of uh, motivation for you to go and download the document and read it and engage with it. And if you see any gaps, please do send those uh, pieces of information on to us so that we can include it into the final version, which will be handed over later in the year to the co-presidents of COP15. Thank you very much, Timothy. Great, thank you, Kobe. Um, I think you've perfectly set the scene and you've said it so well that history is so important. Um, and without giving away too much of what's in the document, I'm uh, you know, now going to start to hand over to our, our, our panel. Um, it's wonderful to have you all with us and uh, you have all been around since the, uh, the early days, if we can call them that. Um, and we really want to take this opportunity to pick your brains and to really uh, draw out uh, some of the key lessons um, over this long uh, history. So uh, without further ado, I'm, go I'm gonna dive right in. Uh, just to let you know, Oliver is not with us yet. He's uh, finishing in another webinar. Um, and so we'll continue. Um, and we do have his pre-recording on hand if need be. Um, but for a moment, I want us all to, to take a step back in time um, and to the year 2006. Uh, where the lab, the Local Action for Biodiversity project is on the horizon. Um, and I want uh, our four panelists to, to kindly think back to this, you know, this time period and this planning phase, um, coming from a time where local and subnational governments were not on the radar of the CBD as they are today. Um, and I, I want to turn to you first, Kobe. Um, you know, what was the thinking and the, the partnership philosophy behind the lab project? And, and how was lab so instrumental in shaping uh, the advocacy agenda and in the lead up to Nagoya and the adoption of the plan of action? 
Thank you, Timothy. Uh, I think in true spirit of what ICLE is and what it stands for is that LAB, or the Local Action for Biodiversity Initiative, um, was designed for cities by cities, just like ICLE when it was founded. It was done by cities for cities to give a collective voice in the first instance for cities around issues of biodiversity in the case of LAB, um, but secondly also to bring cities together from around the world in different stages of development and in different stages of uh, taking up this agenda to learn from each other, to share, to inspire and to mobilize together um, to mainstream biodiversity and nature into their city planning and um, to assess what they have in terms of biodiversity on the ground and then to develop action plans and strategies of how they can protect what they have and restore what they've lost and really provide a meaningful experience for our majority of people who live in urban urban settings at the moment um, so that they can expect uh, uh, again a life connected deeply with nature as it should be so la provided us with that basis it was it was the brainchild of three cities Cape Town, uh, Durban, both from South Africa, it's a Queenie, Durban, Cape Town, and then also Edmonton. And we have Grant Pearsall here from Edmonton, um, who actually approached ICLE uh, with a request to start a biodiversity initiative. Um, the, the name lab was decided on local action for biodiversity, uh, pretty self-explanatory, and that was in 2007. And the motivation was to get 21 pioneer cities from around the world who can work together to build up a body of knowledge and to share experiences around what they're doing around nature and the protection of biodiversity. Um, but soon the 21 pioneers actually grew over into well over 50 cities that finally participated in our local action for biodiversity program. And what is significant is that LAB then gave birth to a new initiative. Uh, it's basically the new generation lab. And that program is called Cities with Nature. We're going to talk maybe a little bit more about that later. So LAB really was an incubation, very exciting incubation period for all of us but it was also giving birth to an institutional process within ICLE. Um, and uh, this is where we, why we exist today, the Cities Biodiversity Center, because soon we realized that there's such an appetite for cities to connect on biodiversity that we needed to provide a center of expertise and excellence within ICLE, the Cities Biodiversity Center, which is embedded in the ICLE Africa office today. And that was all because of LAB. So many, many things happened from LAB. And yeah, it was a very inspirational time at the time. Um, it gave birth also to the first Urban Nature Forum in 2006. Um, uh, which was uh, repeated again in 2009 in Edmonton. Um, so yeah, it started a process. There was a process of advocacy going on at the same time. Um, and LAB started, started the process parallel to that advocacy process of uh, enabling cities to take action on biodiversity on the ground. So we had action on the ground and parallel to that, we had our advocacy and political processes of mobilization. Fantastic. Thank you, Kobe. Um, that set the, the stage perfectly for me to hand over to Grant. Um, you know, you've mentioned, Kobe, that, that Edmonton was one of the lab pioneer cities. And Grant, I wonder if you would just take a moment to uh, tell us a little bit about Edmonton's pass, uh, participation in the lab project and, and how that uh, provided a foundation for uh, Edmonton to strengthen its commitments to protecting biodiversity over the last sort of decade or so. Over to you. Very good, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and meeting up with some people, even virtually, that I haven't seen for a while. So the lab program came to us at a very good time. We had, uh, the city of Edmonton had started a biodiversity program. It was, it was just called a natural area program at the time. And uh, that was 2002. And we were sort of working our way through what it meant to be a natureful city and what does it mean to have nature in our city and then the lab project came along just at the right time we 
weren't quite in sync, but we were in sync in what our sensibility was. And so we started to work on work together and started to learn a lot from uh, all the other cities that were in lab. And it gave us a big boost to know kind of what is possible out there. Because when we're sitting here in Edmonton, relatively isolated, it was hard to connect with people and understand what was going on in the world. We didn't really have the internet developed to the state it is today. So this, the lab program coming out of Cape Town just really filled a niche that was needed, I believe, throughout the world. And I think the proof is it's still relevant today. Fantastic. That's amazing. Um, as we say, it is still relevant today. And as Kobe mentioned, um, we're seeing you know, the second generation of lab in the form of Cities with Nature. Um, that we are also really excited about. Um, so, you know, dealing with the same sort of time period, I want to to hand over to you, Suzanne. Uh, you, you know, you've walked the journey with ICLEI for many years now, and I wonder if you would share some recollections and memories um, of of this period and time in terms of the global partnership, um, the especially COP9 um, in Bonn. Um, and the Mayor's Conference on Local Action for Biodiversity. Thanks for being with us and over to you. Hello, Timothy, and hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I am so happy to listen to Grant and Kobe because that was really exciting times. We were all pioneering at that moment. Bonn was uh, going up to a COP hosting role and entering the lab group that was so stimulating also for our own work um, on site in Bonn, where we also uh, benefited extremely from the processes connected to the lab project, like the assessment, like the drafting of our first biodiversity strategy. Towards COP, um, the global uh, action for local and subnational, uh, the, glo the global partnership for local and subnational action for biodiversity started to take off. We had phone conferences um, over five continents. Um, at that point, it was really people driving it, um, like Oliver Hillel in the CBD Secretariat, who's not yet with us, like Lena Chan from Singapore for the uh, scientific community, um, the COP cities from before, like Curitiba and the candidate for 2010, Nagoya, and uh, you, Grant, everybody was on board. We were going up to COP9, preparing an ex exhibition which showcased how we would advocate biodiversity, hosting side events, cumulating in the mayor's conference, the mayor summit on uh, local action for biodiversity, which brought together 150 leaders in Bonn. And we managed, which was a huge, um, novelty to bring four of these leaders into the high level segment. Today we would say, oh, four leaders in the high level segment, that's not much. But at the time, that was a huge door open thanks to the CBD and to the German presidency. So the Bonn call was issued. And when I look at this document, I can actually see everything was already in it, namely the awareness how important cities are, what cities can do, cities and regions, and how important it is to do this together with other levels, to be empowered and to empower others, to see the links between biodiversity and other challenges and tasks we have. All this was already in the Bonn call. And I am not as I was not astonished at the time that shortly after the global partnership was officially kicked off during the IUCN conference. And that global partnership was special in several ways. First of all, it was driven by people. Institutions were behind, but people really, really could drive this partnership and push it forward. And secondly, the collaboration between UN international uh, environmental associations, networks, cities and regions was unique at that time. It was universal. And 
this thought was the central theme which brings us forward already now and it's actually very logical as a way from the first decision 928 um, towards the plan of action to Nagoya and what where we are now and I think I should end it here. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for your insights, Suzanne. That's uh, that's really, really useful um, and, and interesting to hear of, of the history. Um, I want to just turn to Grant briefly. Um, Grant, do you remember these days? I mean, tell us your experience about the, the first summit you experienced and, you know, as the momentum started to grow and, and local and sub-national governments were, you know, this thread that Suzanne spoke about, um, you know, how was this experience for you from a local government perspective? Yes, excellent um, question. As I think back on it, we had never participated in something like this, like sort of at the granular level. You know, we'd been at conferences that were more high level, but getting together and meeting people in different from different cities in different countries and talking about what their actual issues were um, was very different for where we were from. And I shared this in the other webinar about uh, Volvis Bay, Namibia, was getting up to do a presentation, and I think it was in the first one in Zagreb, Croatia. And we were listening, oh, sorry, he was going to speak, and I thought, how could this even be similar to what's happening in Edmonton? And so he gave the talk, and I realized I could have given his talk and just substituted Edmonton. So, you know, we found out that even though countries and cities that are in different continents halfway around the world, we're all bound together. But the other side of it is we do express how we um, worked with nature differently based on our various cultural backgrounds. So it was a very enriching time and it really gave us um, a lot more confidence. I remember going on a field trip and uh, I was with a woman from um, Europe, and they were going to show us, this was in Singapore, we're going to show us one of their um, projects. And the person was saying, yes, we are doing something like this in Europe, it's really great, and let's see what Singapore is doing. And as we got closer to the project, we are going to Henderson Waves, and, um, and then she said, we didn't dream big enough. And that struck me all the time from when I was with Lab. I think Lab helped people dream bigger. And once you dream bigger and you achieve it, you realize probably I should have dreamed a little bit bigger. So that's really sort of at the core of what I feel my Lab experience helped our city. Fantastic. Um, I think that that's a perfect way to, for us to fast forward now to um, to the last decade. So if I take you all to 2010 um, and the, the COP in Nagoya, um, you know, dreaming big, I want to ask you, Kobe, um, thinking back, did you ever think we'd be standing here today, a decade on from this pivotal moment? And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like you to reflect for a second on, on how Decision 1022 and the Plan of Action really set the scene uh, for the advocacy agenda that followed in, in the last decade. Timothy, this morning in the webinar, I said, absolutely, I knew we were going to be here. Um, and it's a woman's prerogative to change her mind. So let me say no. I couldn't in my wildest dreams think that we would be here at this moment. And really both of those sides of the coin are true for me. Because in some ways I knew that what we started there and the inspiration and what Grant described here as the passion that we saw in cities on the ground when they started connecting with each other about nature. I knew then that we started something that would never stop. Um, cities naturally want to connect to each other. They want to learn from each other. They want to cross the divides and they, sh they see the commonalities uh, in, in the most unlikely of places and conditions. So yes, in that way, we started something that certainly is only growing and will continue to grow stronger. Now um, it's under the banner of cities with nature. Um, and as we see so many new cities flocking to cities with nature, it's just a testimony to that. So the dreaming bigger 
absolutely yes. I also knew that we should be dreaming bigger all along. And um, from from within the ICLI community of about 2,000 cities around the world, each one of them are doing in one way or another something very good for nature and with nature right now. And those lessons are fantastic to learn and to share. So another, another um, key aspect of what started in the plan of action was that that mobilization was now happening uh, with the backing and with the enablement and endorsement of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. So the role of the UN in all of this um, is pivotal. It gave us the confidence, it gave us the platform, it uh, opened up so many opportunities for us to be heard and seen in the global space. And at the moment, there's great convergence here of different national governments, different sub-national governments and local governments and their partners and their networks like ourselves coming together to work towards a, a very strong um, and inclusive post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So the advocacy, the uh, opportunities that opened up for us through a, a very small project lab, which turned into a much bigger community in the end, um, is just astounding. And um, that I probably wouldn't have foreseen um, uh, at that stage. But looking back at the plan of action, um, the tremendous amount of uh, uh, different initiatives, the richness, the variety, the many actors and the many partnerships that formed in the process was simply astounding. And um, the partnerships that we have today, you can see all the logos at the bottom of the screen there. Um, that's, that's the big ones. There are many, many others, um, cities, individuals, cities but also organizations within countries and within cities that are part of this movement so it's 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 really been a convergence of and formulation of new partnerships and even beyond partnerships friendships and solidarity which is going to take us uh, to a place where we can actually address the issues of nature, the very real issues of nature that we see here in our world today. And um, I think one of the key lessons that I've learned is that a process like this also opened up the much needed uh, space for multi-level governance to flourish, where you have the different levels of government from local through uh, provincial, state level, up to uh, federal level, um, national level, and then also continental and global level. That multi-level governance um, cooperation is more important than ever. And um, this process uh, of addressing nature in cities is a manifestation of how well it can work if these different levels of government actually work together. We also see it in the COVID-19 pandemic at the moment where uh, different levels of government are coming together to find solutions for communities on the ground. And there are many success stories where these levels of government really converge and work together from all around the world. The same is true for nature. And the same is true also for addressing the SDGs, climate change, and the many other global development challenges we are facing today. For sure. Thanks, Kobi, for those uh, insights and reflections. I'm going to hand over to Suzanne. Uh, you know, as you look back on the past decade, uh, what are some of your key reflections, um, specifically around the, the success of summits that have taken place um, alongside each COP? Um, and Kobi's just now mentioned the, the SDGs and the climate agenda. Um, and I know you've been, you know, had a strong connection to both those agendas. So maybe in your reflection, you could touch on the linkages between the two um, as we've evolved over the last decade. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, when I think of the past decade, um, I witnessed three or five COPs and uh, local and subnational summits. And what struck me perfectly is how easily they integrated into the COPs in the past years with support of the presidencies and the hosting regions and cities and how high the level of engagement by the leadership has been, uh, for example, in drafting the Cancun communique and uh, 
in uh, setting up uh, collaborative uh, formats during the COP. For example, I remember a workshop set up by ICLE and the CBD um, on a tool for collaboration between the different levels of governance. And it was really exciting to share with a government representative from Bhutan, with people from uh, African cities and uh, I think it was Quebec from Canada at one table and to just find out what would be helpful in the transmission and in the collaboration of the three levels. Um, actually, I see that red seam of vertical integration becoming stronger and stronger over the years from Nagoya to Hyderabad to Pongchang to Cancun and to Sharm El Sheikh and now to Kunming next year. And I have really high hopes that the Edinburgh process will bring that forth another big milestone. And um, all along that process, that has been a huge stimulation for our own work in the city, getting more ambitious every time when hearing about what other cities did, uh, establishing new management systems, doing new assessments, um, trying to join initiatives, that has been strong. When you talk about the SDGs and the context and climate and biodiversity, I would see it in a minimum in the triangle of climate, biodiversity and land, because just recently in a workshop of the Edinburgh process, it has been said that the main uh, reason for the loss of biodiversity is still loss of land or degradation of land. So I think these has, have to be seen together. And yeah. um, I think that it, that is one of the most important things, multidimensional. Absolutely. The are multidimensional. Absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. And um, I want to just turn to Grant uh, very briefly, Grant. Um, tell us how, you know, alongside this, this very ambitious advocacy agenda, um, how has the work of Edmonton evolved in the last decade? Yeah, over the last decade for us has been um, great growth in this particular area. Edmonton's always had like a strong current of nature protection, but as we got to be a bigger city and, you know, we hit a million people, we had a lot of challenges to kind of figure out. You know, density was increasing, more people were there. Like every city has to do this, and we're a relatively small city in the world, sort of like number 450th in population. But we started to implement some of these programs. And what, to my delight and surprise, is it really is true. Just get started and things, positive things can happen. So where we started at the start of the 10 years, I felt I was kind of the complaints department. As I was hired, there was only one of us dealing with nature. And I had to write all the letters and do all the interface with people that were upset about how the city was dealing with nature. But over time, we got better at it, we got better, and all of those complaints helped us get better. And we learned what the citizens wanted and what we could do. We worked really hard with our land development community, who are a huge stakeholder, got an understanding of what we can do together. And so now we are, 10 years later, looking ahead, and we see quite a bright future. However, we're still a lot of things to work out our relationship with uh, on the climate change agenda and the biodiversity agenda has not come into focus and i'm not really seeing it come into focus on the international level maybe others that are closer can see it but i think those two areas are going to be challenging for cities to try and reconcile both of them at the same time um yeah. it's a longer discussion but that's uh, I think some of the challenges as we look forward in the next 10 years. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you've, you've brought us now to that exact point in the conversation where I'd like us, uh, you know, to, to now start looking to the future, um, this bright future, as, as you've mentioned. Um, and I want to start with Suzanne and Grant. Uh, maybe we go with Suzanne first. Um, what are your thoughts on what needs to be done from a local government perspective? I mean, in the coming decade, uh, you know, based on the lessons we've learned, what, what should we bear in mind as we move into the, the post-2020 era? Suzanne, I'll start with you. 
Thank you, Timothy. Yeah, yes. Yes, I hear you. I have some, some trouble unmuting myself. Um, first of all, the spirit of the SDGs. Uh, like cities in the world, Bonn has set up an SDG strategy and systematically brought everything together. Uh, that applies also for our work um, in the multi-level cooperation. Uh, thinking of the SDGs and how they are connected and finding a balance. That is the first one. Second one, keeping in mind the importance of data. Data collection is everything because without valid data, we can't do anything uh, in global strategies. And these data are collected locally. They have to feed in our national strategies. We think of different ways of dealing with biodiversity. If we don't have space, we expand biodiversity. We have to upgrade the biodiversity we have, which is the goal which has to be part of the plan of action and post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And um, the Enbury process is leading us towards that. Lastly, leave no one behind is a very important uh, ambition we should foster, especially in particular in the times of the pandemic that has been so evident all over the world uh, that people are dependent on biodiversity to, to feed them also in these uh, demanding times. So we should keep in mind um, how ecosystem services can really uh, contribute to leaving no one behind. And I'd like to close with a quote I found, uh, which I'd just like to read to you. Um, we can, however, create a new kind of no new, new normal with a kind of transformative changes that will enable us to recraft our relationship with land, biodiversity and the climate system. Building back better, stronger and smarter means embarking on a journey where we create the conditions for nature to take care of us, a new social contract for nature. This is a quote by Elizabeth Mrema, Ibrahim Chaw, and Patricia Espinoza. And I think this is the ambition we should have. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, that's a very powerful quote. Um, and on that note, I want to just hand to Grant for. Uh, some closing remarks, Grant. Any thoughts on what we need to do? You know, what do we need to keep advocating for? What do cities need? Um, your your thoughts on the coming decade? Over to you. Grant, are you there? There's. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Okay. I think what we need to do is um, stay the course and not take the position that we've arrived. Um, I think that we're still in a fragile state with uh, nature in cities as a legitimate activity. Not all cities do it, not all. It's a long history of what is the proper role of a city to do. So, certainly in Canada, um, this is not a traditional role, this should be a provincial role or a national role, but uh, primarily a provincial role, and that is not something that has been taken up. So cities are starting to take this activity on. In order to do that, say in Alberta, we were advocating actually to change the planning laws to give cities more um, authority, more enabling legislation to protect nature. So this will be an ongoing um, um, endeavor. And we have many other people that are also um, advocating for their own particular resources out of all the things that cities have to, 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 to deliver to their citizens. So I'd say in the future, we got a bright future, but we've got to stay the course. We've got to keep focused. And a new generation is coming in, and they're going to put a new um, face on it. But I think we've got to help everybody keep the momentum going. We haven't arrived yet. Absolutely. I see that we've just been joined by Oliver. Um, so, Oliver, if I may, I'm going to call on you right away. Um, I just want to give you an opportunity to, um, you know, we've been reflecting in the last few minutes on 
the last decade and the momentum that has brought us to today. Um, and I wondered from your perspective, um, just give you a chance, uh, give you the floor to share some of your uh, key thoughts and reflections and, and maybe you can combine that then with your, your, your ambitions for the future and what, what you hope to see. What are the key lessons we, we learn from the plan of action and all that's taken place under it over the last decade and, and what must we critically include in the post-2020 framework going forward? Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Can, can, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm so sorry I couldn't join you before, uh, and maybe that will be my entry into this discussion. I am just, uh, it was breathtaking to participate in the webinar that I was just uh, coming from, which is on resource mobilization for biodiversity and ecosystem services in, in the post-2020 framework. The maturity of that discussion, the depth of the, of the insights that we had, uh, I think was a great testimony of the, I, I couldn't call it anything else than transformative. Looking back, you know, I was reading Eclay's excellent report on what's been happening over the last years, and it still wasn't uh, complete because we're still remembering things that have totally to do with this evolution. So I, I can only say, from my perspective, at least it's been a transformative ride. And, and Grant, you've been part of it. Suzanne, you've been part of it. Colby, too. So I, I think it's it's uh, we can look back with a lot of uh, not, um, you know, not being proud unduly, but just it's it's part of a big wave. And I cannot, I mean, my basic conclusion at the end of that webinar, which I want to share with you now, is as citizens and professionals, we just cannot allow any future plan, development, climate, energy, infrastructure, finance, economy, incentives, whatever you want. We cannot allow these to go forward without a component of nature at all levels of governance. We cannot allow um, our own systems uh, to not harmonize policies across all levels. And many of the ways that we know that works, and we know it works, so, you know, looking back on those 10 years, Tell me what the challenge is, and I can tell you, because we have over a million mayors and maybe 60 or 70,000 governors all over the world, the chance that there are brilliant solutions in there is very high and probably even higher than that with the 200 national governments that we have. So in this sense, to me, uh, the solutions are around us. We must, um, we cannot afford not to scale them up now. So I guess that's where I stop. Thank you. Absolutely. I think you, you're spot on, Oliver, and thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I want to hand over to Kobe now um, for, for some of your closing remarks, Kobe. Um, I wanted to just ask, you know, if you look to the future, what, what are your ambitions? What are you hoping to see happen at COP and, and even beyond that in the coming decade? Thank you, Timothy. Um, at the local level, in our cities and in our regional governments, I would like to see that um, nature in all its forms is mainstreamed far more widely in all planning processes for cities and for urban communities as we move forward. We've got to, um, as my friend Andrew Deutsch from the Nature Conservancy puts it so eloquently, we've got to protect the best and restore the rest. And we can do that in cities too. So 10, 15 years ago, it was an odd thing to think about biodiversity in cities because cities were uh, firstly and foremostly thought about as um, concrete jungles in a way and not natural jungles. And now we have initiatives uh, where um, like London uh, National Park City, for instance, is talking about rewilding of London and things like that, you know, so we can bring nature back. And more importantly, we can restore 
people's connection to nature. We can connect to where we get our food from and we can respect the way we deal with nature on a daily basis much more because we understand much better than ever before that people are in, in fact also a part of nature and deeply connected to nature for the spiritual, um, emotional, uh, uh, um, physical well-being as well as their health in all its shapes and forms, community health and individual health. So um, at times like this where lots of uh, uh, communities around the world are facing lockdown, we understand how, just how much we need nature and how much we miss being out in nature for those of us who can't be out in nature right now. So we want to, we want to have more parks and more protected areas, but we also want green green buildings, we want uh, biophilic solutions, we want nature-based solutions to fill our cities. Take examples from leading cities like um, Edmonton on the call here, Durban, uh, the founder cities of city of Lab, but also cities like Singapore, etc., who are showing us the diverse ways in which we can bring nature into our lives. And at global level, uh, yes, we definitely need to see a very strong post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and it will only be strong and it will only be implementable if there is full recognition and support and resource mobilization for the local actors, because we know that a lot of the global biodiversity framework decisions will have to be implemented at the local level by mayors, by governors. And uh, we as uh, a city network, ICLE, and our initiative, partnership initiative called Cities with Nature will be right there next to our cities, supporting them all along the way in doing what they have to do to ensure that we restore humanity's relationship with nature. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. Um, on that note, I'd like to uh, just reflect on a, a quote. You, you've pretty much said it already, Kirby, but a, a quote from one of the co-chairs um, in, in developing the post-2020 framework. And this is a quote from Mr. Francis Ogwell, um, and I'm quoting him in the Edinburgh process, in the introductory sessions, you know, where he, he was saying that cities are where the action is, and without their active participation in implementing the new global biodiversity framework, it will not succeed. Um, and I think that's a, a perfect place to, to leave the discussion. Um, you can see on your screen now a timeline of uh, the, the history, uh, which we will make this presentation available to you um, for your information afterwards. So um, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, it's been wonderful to have you on the line and to pick your brains and to uh, really explore some of the deep and rich history um, of the advocacy process um, from, from your different points of view. Um, and I, I just want to take this moment to express my thanks and, and how grateful we are to uh, have had you on this call. Um, what you see on your screen now, I want to quickly draw attention. We've spoken quite a bit about Cities with Nature. Um, I just want to uh, show you that our, our network of partners um, is growing rapidly and, and more and more from strength to strength each day. Um, I also want to draw your attention on the right to the number of cities we, uh, and I think already this number since this morning's webinar is out of date, um, but we've got over 155 cities now, 54 countries who are really coming on board to, to make their commitments and be part of this global community of practice. Um, as we say, this is, you know, lab 2.0 in a sense. Um, and in the middle panel, I just want to draw your attention to um, uh, the Cities with Nature website. We have our Cities with Nature buzz, uh, which we release monthly now, and all of our updates and, and news articles um, uh, provide a useful way for the constituency to, to remain engaged. Um, and, we, uh, and, and we encourage you to ch keep checking the site um, and uh, regularly um, engage with the process. So very briefly, I want to just say that our next webinar in this series will take place on the 23rd of July, and the links to register for that will also be sent to you in a follow-up email. We encourage you to register, and we look forward to seeing you next time. At this point, I want to hand over back to Suzanne very briefly to just take us through two very exciting events that are upcoming. So Suzanne, the floor is yours.
Suzanne, are you there? Perhaps you're on mute. Uh, I unmuted myself, but I waited for you. Um, so I'd like to extend uh, an invitation, which is um, an invitation by ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability, the City of Bonn, and of course, ICLE President uh, Ashok Sridharan, our mayor. The Daring Cities uh, Forum, a new innovative format, um, takes off this year and it has due to the pandemic uh, to take off virtually in October and this will be a forum to discuss further also about biodiversity, natural and nature-based solutions and the connection between the different challenges we face. Secondly, it's an invitation for tomorrow, World Environment Day. In Bonn, we're celebrating Ludwig van Beethoven's uh, 250th birthday. And in this context, um, we have teamed up with ICLE, UNFCCC, Earth Day Network, and other partners for the so-called pastoral projects with artists and musicians all over the world. And this will accumulate tomorrow in the so-called pastoral day and there will be a live stream tomorrow afternoon just check the website pastoralproject.org for the exact times and content and we're hoping to have you with us online so have a great world environment day thank you suzanne um that uh, that concludes our, our full formalities for today um and i want to uh, take this moment to open the floor for any um, questions or discussion, uh, points of discussion to our panelists. Um, uh, if there are any questions, I remind you that you can make use of the chat box and I will ask my uh, colleagues who are supporting us on the platform to alert me to any questions that are there. Um, or alternatively, you can raise your hand using the panel on the right and we will unmute you uh, to be able to, to say your question. So if there's any questions, please feel free now. It doesn't seem like we have any questions from the attendees, um, unless my colleagues can see any hands. Um, I'll ask maybe the panelists if, if you have any questions for each other or any final closing remarks you'd like to make. Uh, if I may, Timothy, I would just like to say um, um, one thing that um, I would like to emphasize just here is that none of this, none of even this webinar, would not have been possible if it wasn't for the tremendous support that we get from so many partners and institutions and donor agencies around the world. And um, you will also see that we've got a partnership with Expertise France, um, who, uh, whose logo you can see at the bottom of the screen there. They have been um, really fantastic in supporting us uh, in our advocacy process in mobilizing the voice of local and subnational governments ahead of the very historic uh, COP15, which will take place in China next year. And, and that is basically the moment where a new deal for nature will be agreed upon, where the new global biodiversity framework will be adopted. And um, it is very, very important that the voice and the potential contribution of cities and um, um, regions of fully understood and taken up in that global biodiversity framework and without our partners in expertise france and the european commission who supports um, them um, this whole advocacy process that we're driving including this entire series of webinars would not have been possible and then i'm also delighted to see that so many new role players are coming into this space and i want to pay tribute to our long-standing founding partners in cities with nature IUCN. IUCN has been right there from the start as a founding men member with ICLE for LAB and IUCN and ICLE has, have ever since had a partnership um, uh, together in driving the agenda of urban biodiversity and, and a local action for nature. So tribute to IUCN and the IUCN Urban Alliance with whom we work closely um, as well as the many academic institutions 
and uh, the other institutions that we have relationships with, like an, another founding member of Cities with Nature called the Nature Conservancy, of course, and UNEP, um, the CBD, the unwavering support of people like Oliver and others in the CBD over so many years. It's a long, rich history. There's lots to build on, but today was a little bit of a reflection and a celebration of how far we've come just over the last decade. And it shows us how far we can still go in the decades to, to, ahead of us. So thank you. It was uh, really nice to participate in this webinar. Absolutely, Kobe. And while I have you, before you unmute yourself, there's a question from uh, David, who's on the line with us. And David is asking, is there an explicit water component to Cities with Nature? I wonder if you would answer that. Sure. Um, yes, at the moment, Cities with Nature is being built along different pathways. So the one most developed pathway is the is, is basically the, the, the central one around how to mainstream biodiversity and nature in cities. It doesn't specifically focus on, on water, although there are many examples of um, water and, and, and fresh water uh, um, management systems, as well as um, um, the whole issue of urban wetlands, etc., and catchment management, etc. But our partners, uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, has also made available the um, water toolkit, which is amazing and which works very well in different contexts for cities. So there are already a really nice water examples and tools available on cities with nature for cities to engage in. But the plan is certainly to develop a specific dedicated um, um, a pathway or journey that a city can undertake on, on water and nature and biodiversity. Um, it will be linked closely to health and it will also include an element of um, infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, but also integrated water resource, uh, resource management and wastewater management. Um, that is coming, uh, but already you will find a rich um, um, a bed of, of resources related to water on the Cities with Nature website. Great, thank you, Kobe. Um, before we close, I, I'm, I've been alerted to the fact that Oliver has a closing remark. Um, so Oliver, please, the floor is yours, go for it. Thank you so much. And I, I was commenting that I probably should shut up. But anyway, um, I was thinking of a vision for COP16. You know, what is it in, in terms of closing this seminar on, on what we want up ahead? I, I think there's six things and I just wanted to mention them. One, I want a global biodiversity framework that really accepts and, and uh, supports the full participation of all levels of governance. Second, we want a set of tools like on resource mobilization, restoration, uh, mo mainstreaming that also acknowledges that. Third, we want a decision the dedicated decision that complements that and brings this together. But I think the other three things that we probably should mention is first an action platform where people, resources and technology can uh, be mobilized by all levels of government and particularly from subnational and local government. So it would be something instead of having a, an advisory committee, you could have more like a blended executive committee and, and that the global partnership would evolve into an action platform. And then the last two things we need are you know, we have so many great projects already like IKI and Una Rivers and, and so many others beginning like the Regions uh, for Biodiversity Learning Platform. We need those projects upscaled to, to the global level. And we need, of course, the funding pipelines that come along with it. Uh, there's so much great news coming from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, from the GEF um, and from other funders, so an IKI. So we hope that this trend will continue in spite of the challenges and, and that it will include the restoration and recovery packages that we will see ahead. So I just wanted to share with you this kind of vision. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I think that's a really, uh, really nice way to close the webinar with those six reflections. So thank you for sharing them. Um, and uh, with that, I want to just extend a, a huge thank you firstly to everyone who's on the call, uh, all of our attendees. Um, we, you know, we continue to, to rely on your support and your participation, um, and we encourage you to join our next webinar in July. 
Um, I also want to extend uh, our gratitude and thanks to the four panelists. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for walking this road with us. And, and today, thank you for sharing your reflections and uh, all of your lessons. Um, uh, we certainly will continue to work together um, in the coming decades. So thanks for being with us. Um, our contact details are on the screen. Please feel free to write to us at any time uh, or get in contact with our team. Uh, we always are, are willing to hear from you and, and uh, connect with you um, in any way possible. And with that, um, I want to yeah just finally say a word of thanks to everyone. And we look forward to uh, being together next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Timothy. Bye-bye. Thank you.